DCP Player Free. Get it now from digital.net.au. Good morning. Good morning. You can always have a good title when you get to make it up yourself. So. <laughs> I'm Tom LaForge. I'm from Coca-Cola. And as this uh, slide is here to remind you of one thing, I come from this part of the world. I, I'm working in Atlanta right now, but I grew up in California. I grew up in the Bay Area. The San Francisco area for me was the perfect place. I didn't know it at the time, but it was almost as if I was born there to get the job that I have today. And what I mean by that is that there are certain places in this world where sort of cultural hotspots. Think of the things that have come out of, of this part of the world. Right now it's Silicon Valley. Uh, we've had Haight-Ashbury and the hippies have been there. Gay rights have been there. There's a woman named Alice Waters who started this sort of whole fresh um, fresh eating kind of movement, the local organic kind of a movement. We find that certain places in the world, and Richard Florida has written a lot about this, are culturally creative centers. Growing up in that area was just something that allowed me to develop the ability to understand and accept different cultures. And I really attribute this to, this, to these two people right here. This is my mom and my dad. And my father was uh, what you would expect in this part of the world. He was a computer programmer. He's one of the first computer programmers. He, was work he and my mom met at Stanford, and my father was going to be an uh, architect. But these people came to him and said, we, we're looking for computer programmers. And they couldn't just go and find the latest graduates in computer programming because they didn't have them. We weren't teaching people this. IBM hired him in and taught him how to write, to, uh, write computer code. I grew up with the punch cards and all the different big wheels of tape that they had back then. But I bring that up because my father taught me how to think logically. He's very good. If you're a computer programmer, the one thing you needed to be able to do is how to follow an argument and how to persuade this machine to do what you needed it to do. And that's what he taught me. My mother, on the other hand, was a typical hippie for this part of the world. She, I grew up putting this strange green stuff in all my foods and we grew our own vegetables. And she was exactly what you would expect to be a California hippie. She was working at Stanford Hospital as a nurse, and her job was with the, working with the premature babies. And it was her, her job was to figure out, when this little child is crying, what is it that this baby needs? Because these children don't speak. You have to be very, very attuned to these people, because if this child can't tell you what's going wrong, and these are very, very critical life stage for these young babies, she has to be able to understand what's going on. As I got older, she helped me get my first job. I worked as a volunteer at the Veterans Hospital. I worked as a volunteer at, the, at our church. We did the food program for our church, helping homeless. What she taught me was this idea of how do you attune to other people? How do you have empathy for others? And to really be empathetic for somebody, you need to be able to look them in the eye and feel what they're feeling. I love this word, attunement. It's coming in a lot in the business world because the world now is looking for companies that seem to have a human face that can empathize. And when you think about the movie industry too, it's the one reason the movie industry exists. We can look at another human being and understand what is it they're feeling and thinking by looking at their face. I think that's amazing. Why did we evolve so that my inner state can be transmitted to all of you? When the hero is being, feeling proud on the screen, I feel proud. When somebody gets their heart broken, I feel heartbroken. A guy named Paul Ekman started to study this in San Francisco, by the way. He studied the idea that your, faces are, your face reveals your emotions. He wrote a great book called Emotions Revealed. And he went from culture to culture to culture around the world. And he tried to figure out, are there different emotional states? Do we express them differently? And the answer was no. A human being is a human being. Your facial expressions, your feelings are the same everywhere. My title is Human and Cultural Insights. The human insights are the ones that are universal. Something like the emotional states we go to and how do we express them. But if you have a different way of expressing or attaining these emotions, if you want to feel happy, how you seek happiness might be different. That's the cultural side of it. So with that background and another background my parents gave me, which was a philosophy background. I read a lot of different philosophy books. One of them was this one right here. 
It's written by James P. Carse in the late 1980s. And it wasn't until years later, probably about 19, or about 2010 actually, that I went back and I pulled this off the shelf again and I realized that I had been in business for a long time. I, since I started my business career in the 80s to 2010, that 30 year span was the time in which there was a giant shift in how business gets evolved. His key point in this book was that the games people play, you've heard that phrase, he was, that's where it comes from. Finite game is where you really try to win. It's like, you think of a gladiator. At the end, that guy's dead, you've won. Game over. Are you trying to put your competitor out of business? Game over, that's a finite game. But we've gotten to the point where we're so interconnected, electronically and through our economics, in, environmentally, that we realize that we all affect each other. And we're now using words like sustainability and relationship economy and things like that take into account that I can't continue to thrive, you can't continue to thrive, unless we all continue to thrive. And that's this infinite game. We are now at a point where the goal of your business is to continue to play. You can tell when you meet people. Are they out to be the one winner, to destroy somebody else? Or are they the ones that go out there and say, you know what, I'm going to understand my community. I'm going to understand my consumers. And I'm going to try to thrive as they thrive. We're going to work together. The mindset, that shift, is what's been going on. So what this has done is it has allowed me to go to Coca-Cola. And in 2010, we wrote this document. It was called the 2020 Vision. That was probably the best thing that ever happened to my career because every company started to say, what's the future going to be looking like? 2020 became shorthand for, tell me what the future is going to be like. And anytime you're trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future, the best thing to do is to look back at the past. And that's what I started to do. I started to say, I'll be the one who's going to do this. Because you can look at, at lots and lots of data and you can do market projections. But that will tell you how a marketplace is going to go, unfold. What we needed to know was how is the world going to unfold. Because as we become connected to each other, the pace at which culture is evolving is going faster and faster. So we, we realized that my company and your company is going to be affected by two things. The decisions we make and how the outside world is evolving. And if we know how the outside world is evolving, then the, we can evolve along with it. 73% of all brands could disappear and people wouldn't care. This is a report, you can get this online, look for it, it's probably 20, it says the Boss Meaningful Brand Index. They just went out and they simply asked consumers about these brands. Does this brand contribute to your well-being? Does this brand help improve the well-being of your community? Would you even care if this brand went away? And when I saw that number was so high, I mean, that is really high. Because I know some really, really smart people. Before I worked at Coke, I was a consultant at many, many different companies. And we, I found that there are really smart, usually MBA trained people, working really hard to make sure that their brand is accepted, that their brand thrives. And 73% of them were failing at that job, even though they were doing what they were taught to do in business school. We have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? Because between the 1980s and, the, and 2010, Words like Six Sigma and this guy named Deming, he helped us figure out how do we get the machines going. Thomas Friedman showed us that we have these global supply chains. We got to the point where we were really, really good at getting computers and the machines to get everything going. Quality went up and costs came down. It's not that they don't think that you have a bad product out there. If people walk into your theater and that sound is excellent, it's, that sound is much better than it used to be in the past. The visual presentation is much better, but it's not that much different than everybody else. Industry after industry, beverages, cars, clothing, entertainment, has gotten to the point where we have really higher quality, which makes it harder to distinguish ourselves. So when you ask how did this happen, I do think it had a lot to do with the industrialization process. And if you go to some parts of the world, and Coca-Cola is a wonderful company to work for because I've been able to travel now to 35 different countries. And you start to see that there's a lot of similarity, but there also are also some differences. Parts of China right now, this issue isn't much, is what I'm about to tell you, where we have to become these societal brands. 
That's important, but quality is still important there because the variance in quality in many parts of the world is still high. But in most parts of your markets and my markets, we're in a developed world and variance in quality is very low. There's a woman at Harvard, her name is Young Mi Moon. She looked at this and she said, you know what? It's in part, a, she blames herself, she blames people who are doing marketing and research like myself, she blames Harvard, because we got locked into a particular cadence of competition. If you use terms like best practices, and you read industry journals and you figure out what is somebody else doing, once you find the best practice, you use it, and everybody else does too. The harder you compete, the more you learn how to be the best you can be, the more you become just like everybody else. Products are really collapsing into each other. So if I don't uh, like my Dell computer and it just goes away, it doesn't mean I don't like Dell. It just means I believe that there's many other computers that would replace it. This is not the best place to be. If you're trying to get people to want to be loyal to your product, you need to find something to break out of this. So when I mentioned earlier that what we need to do is we need to look at the external forces. If you go around and talk to most people, almost every single person and in every business will tell you that she is looking at these external forces. What's, what they, when they start to tell me more and more about what external forces they are, she goes, well, I'm looking at what my competitors are doing. I'm reading everything that the industry is doing. This circle right here is a tool that we use at Coca-Cola. What we do is we watch what are our competitors doing, what are our customers doing. There's the channel data that we have. There's the category data. We want to know what juices are doing, what coffee is doing, what sodas are doing. Coca-Cola now has become the big, world's largest juice seller. We're the world's largest seller of prepared coffees. We get canned coffees. We sell more of these than anybody else. But we keep adding to this portfolio because we're responding to these external forces. If you continue to do this, and if Coca-Cola continues to do this, we are going to simply collapse into our competitors. And so what we've started to do, and what I suggest everybody needs to be doing, because this is the future of marketing, is that you need to start looking beyond the industry magazines and start looking at the context in which your industry exists. How is it changing? The world is getting to the point now where when I started my career, like in the 1980s, there were a few things that would be global trends, but not a lot. Today, whether it's media, whether it's entertainment, whether it's brands, we now have a world of global products. We have a shared culture. I use the term macro force to mean, how is your environment shifting? We all will behave the same. This is one of the things I found out about people is I talked to sociologists and psychologists and anthropologists and people who really study human beings. Love, love learning about human beings. It's so fun. But the more I look at it, I realize that we really are predictable in one way. You tell me the context in which you live, and I can tell you a lot about how you're going to think, feel, and behave. And so those contexts become the macro forces. And I've got a list, and I'll share them with you later of how is the world changing. Let's understand the environmental conditions and then we'll look at how people respond. If a lot of you respond the same way, we'll call that a people trend. And people trends are where it gets to be really interesting because if your brand is aligned with that trend, as that trend gets bigger and greater and spreads around the world, so too will the affinity with your company, your brand. So it's real simple. The environmental changes get studied and then we see how people respond. After that, I won't go into it today, but then you can figure out how governments are responding, corporations are responding, and NGOs. My CEO, Mutar Kent, calls that the golden triangle. More and more we're finding that corporations and governments and NGOs, or civil society is another way to put it, need to work together to solve a lot of the problems, because a lot of the problems are much bigger than any one person or any one entity can handle. But the point is, get to know these conditions so that you can be one step ahead of understanding how is your industry going to be affected? Now that was a, sort of like an, an intellectual tool, to, and it's not really a fun thing, right? You guys are into the business of storytelling. And so I thought, I'm going to try to put what I just mentioned into a story. And I read a lot of books, and one of them was Dan Pink. Dan Pink writes some of the best books on understanding how culture is changing and how that cultural shift is changing the skills that you need to survive in this new world. 
And Dan, Dan Pink's latest book was called To Sell as Human. And he told a story in this book about a woman named Emma Coates who, who came up with the idea that, wow, I'm really impressed with Pixar, right? Billion dollar movie after billion dollar movie. How do they do that? What is the secret? And she came up with what she called the Pixar pitch. Basically comes down to this. This is the frame of the story. All these big stories, all these big money-making movies come down to this. So the story I want to tell you is that once upon a time, brands competed on functional and emotional attributes. You hear things like taste great and less filling. You know, these are the functional things. You know, the emotional positioning is feel this way when you, when you have this product. If you're in this situation, you want to feel like you and your friends are all having fun, come by this social brand. Or maybe the emotional positioning is you want to feel like the good parent who's nurturing their children, so serve them this juice and you'll feel that way. We got really good at this. And every day, companies made money finding better functional emotional attributes. All right, if you can find a better functional attribute, particularly if it's a really good innovation, you know, like Swiffer is a completely different way to clean the floors, or Post-its comes up a lot, the iPhone that I'll bet most of you have right now. These functional advantages really do help you, but very quickly our competitors catch up. See, and then what happens is that you'll find that one day, category after category is gonna be filled with pretty similar products. Well, because of that, large established companies like mine, we began to lose loyalty. And small brands that were competing against us realized that they need to do something different. And so they started to move into a territory, not functional or emotional, but this social and cultural territory. So we need to understand what is this social and cultural stuff that these brands are doing. Because the better they got at that, we found that big companies began to lose market share. Until finally, brand managers and even the biggest companies realized that they too needed to introduce social and cultural attributes. And that's the part of the story that gets to be really interesting. Because the main point here is brand is evolving. What you think your brand is and what people think a brand should be is not aligning in a lot of companies anymore. And people are looking for brands that really do align with their way of seeing the world. Because if you're still going out there and saying, you know what, come have a quality experience. My brand is about how we provide everything at the highest level of quality. That's, super, that's still very, very important, but it's not going to distinguish you. And so we get out there and we start selling the desired identity stuff. Problem is, mo mostly we found that every single business finds that in their category, there's one or two positionings we all sort of get to them. And we become sort of shades of each other. So they're not that distinguished. If you're trying to come to a place you can relax and have fun with your friends, probably your closest competitors are very similar to that too. But this is where we're starting to see a lot of differentiation. This is about your desired society. Think about this. Brands are not helping me become the person I want to be. This idea that if I drink Corona or, or Dos Equis, I'll be a different person. Now, I'm buying the brands that help me create the world I want to see. Which brand is helping me make the community I want? Which brand is helping me have people treated more justly? Brands are now being used as a way to say, I have a vision for how people should relate to each other, and me and this brand, we share this, and this is how we're making it happen. So an example of what I mean by this, if you look at most of the new brands that are coming out and really starting to thrive, they have this new, from the beginning, they have a social mission. This is Innocent t uh, Juices right here. They believe that there's a better way to feed ourselves versus this industrialized, commoditized way. So they do this very pure, natural. And they're doing exceedingly well with this. The way you treat the planet, the way you grow the food, there's a better way to do it. They follow all those ethical ideas. Tom's Shoes. How many times have you found in a category that somebody comes out and they don't even talk about this is the quality of our shoe or that. This is about making a better world. It's about helping other people. They, they realize something very important. You're going to expect that anybody who has a brand that exists already is gonna already meet these high expectations for quality. So they just simply focused on the next level and they're doing exceedingly well. What I'm finding is that 
all the big companies, the Fortune 500 that I used to consult with and Coca-Cola too, were now asking, how do we become this? Because there, our competitors are doing this. You know, there's companies like Clorox who are coming out with Greenworks because companies that came out with the Method Soap, Method Soap is doing great. I love their idea, they're against dirty. They don't want dirty chemicals in, their ho in your house. They don't want dirt in your house. And so when they realized that they were about making a better household, they really, really started to take market share away from all the big boys. Dove is doing a, what I consider the number one best at doing this. Dove soap used to be about natural beauty and the purity of the product. Now it's really about how should we be treating young women? How do we give girls that are growing up today the confidence they need to succeed in this world? This is about female empowerment. You know, if you saw the movie Frozen, what's the underlying ethos there? That movie is coming out at this time in history for a reason, because it's touching on a trend that's going on. IKEA, when it first started, it was just a furniture store, and it had a subline that was about sustainability. <laughs> Well, they realized very quickly that they need to be, sustainability was what they were about. Now the entire company is about sustainability. Their goal is to, I believe it's 2020 or to maybe even earlier, 2017, to be 100% sustainable in terms of electricity. They are going to create, their goal is not only to be energy neutral, they, they are looking for a way that when they go into a community, they're actually generating more electricity than they use. They are becoming a partner with those communities. They want to be able to say, we're not here to use things. We're here to create things and to make this area more prosperous. When it comes to Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola is a very unique brand. It was mentioned earlier, and I know you all know this, that you can travel anywhere in the world and find a Coca-Cola. There are studies that have been done on how many people are aware of it. The word OK is the number one most well-known brand word in the world. The number one most well-known word is Coca-Cola. Everywhere you go, people know it. These two images, for those of you particularly who grew up in America, Mean Joe Green and the Hilltop ad, we call it Hilltop, but you might know it by it's teaching the world to sing. Why are these iconic images? It's been decades since these have been run, and people still remember them. It's because what was going on at the time, when we had Vietnam going on and there's this big conflict between how should we behave as a society, the conflict was, should you be loyal and trust your government. Or you got this hippie generation saying, you know what, we're going to question authority. That was a social conflict that was really tearing at the, at the fabric of the world. We, did, we will come out at that time and say, can't we just allow ourselves to get along and sing in perfect harmony? harmony? We came and we spoke to a social tension. Mean Joe Green, you know, at a time when the racial tensions were really high in this country. We came out with a message saying, why can't we just find a better way to be kind to each other? Because yes, there are cultural differences, but at the end of the day, we are also just simply human. There are more similarities with each other than there are differences. Brands used to be about showing how I distinguish myself as different from all of you. I believe we're at a point where the brand idea, the concept of brand, is now about I am going to choose brands that represent how I am connected to all of you. We are so interconnected at a world right, as a world right now, we realize that the more we try to separate ourselves, the more the entire system is going to fail. I love this image in the middle here. I didn't bring the video with me, but if you have a chance to get online, we had this machine that we invented. Uh, our vending machines are all over the world, and there's this woman named Jackie Jantos who started to say, how can we use this? This is an interesting idea. We have all these vending machines around the world, and we're getting to the point where everything is becoming digitized and connected to the internet. And so she went to two different countries that have traditionally have had a high degree of tension, India and Pakistan. And she connected two of, the video of these vending machines. They both had a big panel in the front. And the, a kid would walk up to these vending machines, and there was just a circle. And if you moved your, cir your hand around the circle like this, something would happen. But when you saw that circle, on the other side of the circle, you saw the video projection of a child in another country. And so if both of these people put their hand up at the same time and went around like this, instantly a Coca-Cola fell out of the machine. By working together, they were able to both share a Coca-Cola. 
And there's lots more. This, there's, if you get online, you can see that this thing had a lot more to do. They would end up dancing together. But the point is, you watch people laughing and having a good time. And the idea is, when we are connected, we are doing better. We are more similar than we are different. That top image is from our latest ad, and I'd like to show that to you right now. When this ad aired during the Super Bowl, did any of you hear about the conflict that came up about this, or the controversy? See, what we're looking at is there's a really brilliant uh, advertiser at Coca-Cola Company. His name is Jonathan Mildenhall. He's the, the genius behind this ad. And he's looking around, and, and what is that cultural tension in the United States? We come together in this country during the Super Bowl. And what he wanted was a message about coming together. Because what you're hearing a lot in the news is more about keeping them out, or us not getting along, or these people coming and taking our jobs. It's the other is somebody who is, I want to keep away from me. <laughs> but there's a lot more people in this country that are saying, you know what, we can get along, we should get along. And so the question became, when people saw this, is Coca-Cola trying to change my America? Or is Coca-Cola reflecting the way it is today? Or is Coca-Cola saying this is the way it should be? <laughs> We ran the ad, and 90% of the response has been very, very positive. But today, if you're part of that vocal minority that didn't like the ad, you can say a lot on the internet. And there was a, a Twitter hashtag called Speak American <laughs> that was about why th some people didn't like this. A good friend of mine is an anthropologist. She, she has a blog site called The Narcissistic Anthropologist. Please read her, her blog, and she talks very intelligently about why is it that some people would find this ad offensive. Because your self-identity as an American is part of who you are. And people are very, very proud of that. And if I'm trying to tell you, I think you're change, is somebody that's going to come and change who I am, and I don't want to change, there's an issue there. These companies right here, if you're, if you're going to be a company that's going to be moving into this new world, and your brand is now about getting along and helping bring about a thriving society, Zappos right here, Tony Shea's the head of that. He moved his headquarters here. He's in Vegas. And the reason he decided to do that is he wants to be a partner. There's a phrase I like to use, which is leadership is membership. Leadership isn't about being the best one that everybody follows. Leader is now about being connected and being a member of a community. He brought his company here because he wants to be a good member of this community and help the downtown area thrive. Terms of endearment and conscious capitalism are both written by a very smart man named Raj Sisodia. He has a whole list in there of brands that he calls firms of endearment. He wrote this book about seven years ago, and he's been tracking the stock performance of these companies. And they've been outperforming the S&P 500. They outperformed the good to great companies that Jim Collins talked about. And when we had a recession, these companies dipped just like everybody else, but not as far, and they came out quicker. The latest book is written with John Mackey. He's the founder of Whole Foods. Whole Foods is another one of these brands that says, I think there's a better way to feed ourselves. The one thing that we haven't yet figured out, because Raj and I and a few others have been talking about this, is that when you look at these firms that people really feel affection toward, there's a great many of them that are retailers and several different service organizations. What we're going to be researching and looking into is we believe that when you have human-to-human -human interaction with the people that work at Trader Joe's, the people that work at South Southwest Airlines, you get an idea of, do I trust this company? Because trust comes from person-to-person -person contact. You, if you're running a movie theater, 
you have that. You have an environment in which people can experience what you stand for. So anyway, these others are all the different companies. You can read about these. These are true believers. But the issue is, if you're a large company like mine, I mean, you aren't founded by somebody like a Steve Jobs. You have to figure out, using research, how to do this. And you don't need just better research. You just need a different type. And that's macro forces and trends. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, lived there on the moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. That was Carl Sagan, an astronomer. A lot of people don't know this, but he liked to write poetry as well. And he looks at the big picture. This, to me, was the first macro force ever. Because when this picture came out, it started to shift how we think about ourselves. Because your identity has always been me and my group or my church or my neighborhood, my country. This started to get us to think about we are all together on this planet. This really kind of kick-started the whole environmental movement. This right here got people thinking about us as opposed to me and my people. My people became everybody. Mother Teresa would say the problem with humanity is that we don't draw the circle of family big enough. And I think that's what's happening today. That's the th key theme that's going on in this world, is we now realize how interconnected we are. We're, sometimes we're interconnected through violence, and sometimes it's that violence comes from nature. We're starting to think of nature as a threat to all of us. This is something we've caused. We've done depleted the air. The water is getting polluted in large parts of the planet. There's this giant amount of plastic floating around the Pacific right now. We're also depleting the land. But not all of these are negative because the internet is by far the most positive force that's now connecting us all. If you grow up today with the internet, you're growing up with a shared experience with 2.5 billion other people. And by 2020, there's going to be 5 billion other people. And so I'm wondering, how are we going to think and feel and do things differently when you grow up in this environment? There's a guy named Jeremy Rifkin. He wrote this book called The Empathic Civilization. And he just took a couple of fa key facts that we all know, but when he put them together, he realized there's a really interesting implication. That idea that attunement that my mom taught me, that idea that when you're connected to somebody else, you start to build an empathy for them. Well, now that we're all connected on the internet, now that we can travel around much more freely, you all now know more people in your lifetime, far more people than your parents did, and particularly your grandparents. So if more people are getting more and more connections, it logarithmically starts to expand the amount of empathy in this world. So The Empathic Civilization is a 700-page book that you can read, or go to the RSA video online and watch, read the entire book in 20 minutes. <laughs> and you can see that he has a very strong argument for the fact that there is a shift happening in this world right now that is happening for a reason. And he believes it is connectivity driving it. So if you're going to be empathet empathetic, then what are you going to, who is it that this empathy will be applied to? Obama and many other economists are talking about the rich-poor divide. The World Economic Forum gets together every year and they ask, what are the big macro forces going on right now? And what are the big threats to this world? They have a list of the top threats, or risks, they call them, to global stability. This rich-poor divide is happening in every single country, and it's been getting worse since the 1980s. We are becoming two different societies in this country. 
And now one thing that's helpful is when you all have a shared experience, you have a shared identity. But when your world and my world are different, we start to see these other people as somebody who is not like me. This is becoming an issue that I think every country is going to be dealing with very, very soon. Because you're finding that the Arab Spring or all these things that have been going on, Occupy, is starting to bubble up. The president drinks Coke and Liz Taylor drinks Coke. And just think, you too can drink Coca-Cola. A Coke is a Coke and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one the bum on the corner is drinking. <coughs> now we probably would have used a little more, we wouldn't use the word bum anymore. <laughs> but the point is, again, this is a brand that brings people together. It's just built into our DNA. And what I see now is many brands are trying to come to this territory. We need to find ways that say, you and I share something in common. When people walk into your establishment, they, whatever visual cues, semiotic cues, sort of the idea that, oh, isn't this nice? I'm feeling welcome here. We're all connected. Because Coca-Cola can be one of those ways of saying that. We have education rates are rising around the world. Boy, the difference between the boys' educations and the girls' educations is really narrowing. There used to be a really big gap. Other than certain areas of the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa where there still is a substantial gap, we're closing that gap. But when you close that gap, some people disagree. The global trend is we all tend to love this. Women being empowered is a positive thing. But keep in mind, not everybody always agrees. And Malala taught that very, very strongly to the rest of the world. Women are now becoming billionaires due to their talents as business persons. And I really do believe that this is going to be a trend that we are all going to see for a key reason. I talk a lot with this guy on the next slide here. This is John Hagel. He works at Deloitte. He, they, Deloitte has a group called the Center for Edge Innovation. He does the kind of thing I do. You kind of look at the big picture. And when you are in a uh, situation where you're all interconnected and you're all becoming this relationship economy, what are the skill sets you're going to need to be a good business leader? You need the ability to maintain a large network of trust-based relationships. Women are really, really good at this. Men can do it too. I think men, the men who think more like women will end up thriving. But while we were building the machines and we were trying to compete against each other, the Gordon Gecko mindset, the male mindset, was really what brought you to success. This feminine archetype is now going to be what brings success. And this is how do we find a way to work together? How is the system, how is the relationship overall affected as I make my decisions? How do you think holistically is going to be a key talent? And of course, some of these trends that are going on around the world are negative. We all know that lifestyle diseases are out there. Coca-Cola is somebody who's also very concerned about this. Because the choices you make on the calories that go in and the calories that go out, or whether you smoke or drink alcohol, these are choices that affect your health. It used to be communicable diseases affected a lot of people. We're going to be spending trillions of dollars, $20 trillion, I believe, by 2020, just trying to address this as a society. How do we all work together to address these issues? Oh, um, the aging population is the last one I want to talk about. Look who's in this room and think about the one thing that has happened with, the entire, with this world today that hasn't happened in the past. We now have one out of every three human beings, 40 or older. And if you did all your Maslow work and all that, like Coke, man, boy, we know teenagers. We know teens really, really well. And we know what that teen life stage is like. We know that these kids want to have fun with their friends and establish their own self-identity in the world and see where they fit in. But when you're 40, you've kind of established that. You've built a house, you've built a home, you've got kids, you've got maybe aging parents. You're starting to value things like community. You're volunteering more. Eric Erickson is a psychologist who looked at this life stage and he says, he calls it your other oriented. You're not just about yourself anymore. You've kind of grown out of that selfish life stage. And you're now thinking about other people. He says that the number one existential question at that life stage is, how is my life meaningful? What is it that I am doing that has a sense of purpose to it? I never thought this would happen, but you're starting to see those words in most of the business literature. Purpose and meaningfulness are now business words. How do you give your people a sense of purpose that work for you? 
The people who provide a sense of purpose to their employees have companies that are thriving. These people will work harder. So when you put it all together, some of these are threats. People are feeling like the outside world is scary. But more importantly, we've got many, many more of these that are making us feel like we can do something about it. We can do something to make this world a better place. Because when you turn on the news every day, this is what people see. And you've got two choices, it's basic psychology. Do I simply want to escape from this and just go to an oasis where, you know what, I don't have to think about this stuff anymore. More and more, people are using this idea that, yes, I feel good and happy when I escape from it, but I think I also feel better when I'm addressing it. And when you're addressing the problem, and brands like Coca-Cola and others are helping to address the problem, it makes you feel even more uh, like there's going to be a reason to be optimistic. And what that's causing is that brands need to show that they're improving well-being, they need to show that brands are improving well-being of communities, and I need to trust that you really are doing this authentically. Because there's words out there, we've all heard of the word greenwashing, I'm starting to hear the word goodwashing too. Every company looks like they're trying to do good and that's just because they want you to think that they're a good company. It requires trust. And when you're looking at trust, everybody here wants to be trusted. And you provide a great product and they will trust you. You can trust that most produced products, most films that you go and watch, you're going to trust that the quality is there. there. We are all really competent at delivering a clean location with a great environment, high quality sound, high quality visuals. But on the other side is, if this company is making products, do I trust that they can not only make products that are good, but do I really trust that they care and act for the well-being of others as much as they do their own? This is where you're going to start to see most companies spending a lot of their time. At Coca-Cola, we've got this program called 5 by 20. We're going to empower 5 million women entrepreneurs by 2020. We're training them. We get this training. We have an accounting firm making sure that all these women are properly trained in business uh, skills. And then if they choose to, they can go and become suppliers of the ingredients that make our products or maybe selling our products or working with our recycling programs. But the point is, by 2020, we want these 20 million women, these 5 million women, to have a thriving entrepreneurial way of sustaining their well-being. In large parts of the world, and this is a global program, it's very difficult for a woman to find a way to make a living. We have this thing called Eco Center, too. The, um, many of you might know this machine that's in some of your uh, locations. It's called Freestyle. It's a touch screen that allows you to you know, pick up to 150 different combinations of different sodas. And that is a great machine. If you watch it, people just love it. We're getting to the point now where we just need a little more play in our life. And that's just a fun way to interact with the machine. But the guy who invented that is a guy named Dean Kamen. He's one of the many people who helped us invent it. All the guts that are inside that machine it was invented by the same guy who invented the Segway. Dean Kamen has also invented this little thing that purifies water. And when he came to Coca-Cola, he started a, a friendship with our CEO who promised to put these water purifying things all over the world. And the program became known as EcoCenter. And when we looked at where are these needed, they're needed where there's no electricity. So we built this like box, it's a our cargo container that has electricity being provided on the top. It's generating it through solar. What else don't they have? Oh, they need a hotspot. They're not on the internet. So these communities are now getting connected on the internet. They have water, they have electricity, they have internet connectivity. Inside there, they're there storage for vaccines. These are going to places where Coca-Cola, if we do one thing exceedingly well, it's logistics. We get everywhere. Now these vaccines will be coming with us as we go into these eco centers. And those five by 20 women, some of them will be running these locations. We thrive as they thrive because they'll also be selling our products. Cokes, I, we're in a large part of the world. This is a way to extend our reach even further. But we're not going to do it in a way that just helps us. Yes, it will help us. But as we thrive, they thrive. We're reinventing capitalism. As you read all these different books, the idea of what it means to be a business person is changing. The key theme to all of these is that caring and acting for the well-being of others is the best way to improve your company's future. 
So I'm not saying that we're all out to do good in this world, that we all need to be turning Coca-Cola into a philanthropy, that you need to provide people with free tickets and make sure that you're providing all your profits to somebody else. We're still competing. But competition used to mean that we strive together. We've taken it to mean to strive against. Coca-Cola will continue to compete. You will continue to compete, but compete in a different way. We are striving together. So to conclude this, I just go back to that first book that I got from my parents. And it was about, it was about how do we thrive together? Because that finite economy is not going to allow the world to continue. We are using more resources than we can sustain on this planet. But I believe we're moving into the relationship economy where we are striving together. And if you think about this, you're still competing, but you're competing in a different way. That's how you are going to outcompete your competitors. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions, I believe we have some time for some questions right here. I brought up many different topics. Uh, some of them I know very, very deeply. Some of them I'll be happy to share that I know nothing about, if, you, if that's what you're asking. But if anyone has a question, I'll be happy to entertain them now. We have microphones, one up here in the front, and one in the middle aisle toward the back. Yeah, right over here. How do you overcome the widespread pessimism all the way through society? Yeah, how do you overcome widespread pessimism, which is everywhere? I was talking about trust. If you look at trust scores, there nobody trusts big anymore, all right? Big governments are not trusted. Big corporations are not trusted. And there's a woman um, called Lynn Twist who wrote a book called The Soul of Money, and in there she talks about what she calls the three toxic myths. And people really, these are myths that we all believe, but you know what, they're really not that true. She says that there's the myth that there's just not enough to go around. We're getting to the point now where we can produce enough. If you've heard, for example, take an industry I know quite well, food. We can produce enough. It's just getting it to the right people. You don't have to get yours before the other person gets theirs. It's not a competition where it's win-lose. That's the other toxic myth, that myth that she talks about. But Lynn Twist also says there's a third myth, which is, and that's just the way it will always be. We have, to have, we have to start realizing that change is possible. Pessimism is out there. We deal with it all the time. I get pessimistic too. But the Coca-Cola brand itself is about optimism. Trust scores are so low because we're not seeing enough big institutions do the right thing. Big governments have been shown to not be trusted. Angela Mer Merkel told Obama when, she, when he came to visit that friends don't spy on friends. We don't have big examples of big institutions that are doing anything that isn't selfish. We saw Enron and we saw Bernie Madoff. We've seen too many big abuses, governmental and companies. But Spider-Man's uncle, Ben Parker, said, with great power comes great responsibility. What we're looking for is companies that are using that responsibility to help others. I, as I see more and more Zappos out there, more Whole Foods, these companies that are firms of endearment, we're going to shift from that pessimism to optimism. But the scores we're seeing now that governments can actually improve the world are now in the, in the gutter, all right? Big corporations are trusted very, very little. Down below is Congress, all right? <laughs> Congress is in like the single digits at this point. And in a way, I'm actually starting to be optimistic about that and say, you know what, it might be a good thing. Because you're getting this gridlock at the national level. We're talking at each other. We're not talking with each other anymore. We're becoming very, very moralistic. A guy named um, Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. And in it, he's, he uses this phrase, he said, God and the devil have never issued a joint communique. <laughs> because... Either you're right or I'm wrong. And we're trying to do that. We're trying to say, I'm always right, you're always wrong. Maybe gridlock at the national level is good because you know what that's doing? It's pushing the power down to the city level. Look at what's happening in, in cities. City mayors are much more community-minded. 
and we're doing things to help each other. I'm very optimistic about local governments, maybe not so much about large governments, but the point is there is a need to make this shift, and if companies like Coke can be a part of that, you're going to be much more optimistic than if you're trying to make these changes on your own as an individual. Any other questions? One right over there, maybe? talking about this succeeding or thriving when others thrive, and once it comes to the corporate culture internally, things like you know people's evaluations, how they move up the company, get promotions, mm -hmm. is it still the same old beat out the other guy for the job, or you know hit my quota, or are, are we supposed to be moving toward uh, a broader range of measures? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how do we evaluate people? Actually, uh, this guy named Edward Deming, who, who brought to the world how do we make all of our factories work well. Toward the end of his life, he wrote a list of what he considered the, like, uh, it was called like the diseases of business. And one of them was the annual review. Um, we are really at a situation, that it gets, I think the worst example is right in these large consulting firms around Wall Street, where we look for next year, we're going to promote one partner, all of you are going to compete, and so you're competing against everybody else in your company. The structure in which you operate will dictate how you behave. That's the key thing. The macro force or the environment is how is your company setting up evaluations. I'm finding more and more, I'm working with HR departments on how is the world changing, because they're realizing they need to change their structure. Uh, we can get people to behave differently if we put them in a different situation. So what is a reward structure that would cause people to behave in a way where you thrive as everybody else thrives? At the Zappos company that I mentioned earlier, they just got rid of job titles. They have now moved from a hierarchical to a completely matrixed organization. So they're trying to figure out if they can change their organizational structure to encourage the right behavior within the company. So this is, we have to get from a mindset of there's a finite amount of resources that we all have to divide up and you better get yours before I get mine and find a way where we're encouraged and rewarding people who share. Our CEO at our company, or, I'm sorry, our CMO, Joe Tripodi, has been circulating this article he found in, in the um, Harvard Business Review that talks about there's been a study on the people who share the most information are the ones that tend to get, who tend to thrive better within a corporation. Because it used to be, what he's trying to do is make sure that this idea of silos where I hoard information, information is power. The one thing that the internet has taught us is that information is more valuable when it's set free, when it's shared. And we have to find a way to connect to each other and help educate each other. The people that you know in your life that help you grow and learn about this world are usually the ones that you're more willing to help grow as well. So we have to find ways to organize ourselves so that we're inspiring and encouraging a different set of behaviors. So I know we need to get on to the next speaker. I appreciate your time and the attention. And I certainly hope that in the future, when you're looking at your industry and you are going to continue to look at your business, your competitors, your industry information, just draw that circle a little bit further. And I ask that you look at cultural information once in a while. Thank you.